Pastor Dan. Great greetings from Holy Word Austin. I was with the, the saints over there this morning, and I'm uh, really happy to be with you and worship with you today. If you would, if you would open up your Bibles, uh, you can open up your apps, you can open up your physical Bible, Luke chapter 7. We're looking at the faith of a Roman centurion, and we're going to get to talking about that in just a second. Um, this past week, I had a rec league basketball game. I don't know if any of you knew this, but I really enjoy playing basketball. You're going to get to know your pastors really well this summer. We're coming to visit. You'll, you'll learn more. That's one thing I like, but one, one thing I really enjoy, especially this week, was that my family came along to watch my game. And usually the games get pretty late, so sometimes they can't come, but this was an early game. And, uh, and they got my four-year-old and my two-year-old came along, and they are my favorite fans when they come because they never remember any of dad's misses. And every time that dad turns the ball over, daddy's helping the other team. He's being a good sport in their eyes. And they cheer me on, and they cheer me on, and uh, they're oblivious to the scoreboard. Well, this game, and i got to tell you, this is our first uh, season in the competitive league. Uh, we are a little bit below 500. We aren't the worst team in the league, but we are far from the best. And this week, we absolutely got our doors blown off. It was ugly. And we lost by 15 points, only because the other team stopped trying in the entire second half. The best part, I didn't even tell you, the, the other team, they started with four players for the first 10 minutes. Yeah. Did I tell you that my family was there to see that? Yeah. On the way home, I was driving, and uh, my four-year-old in the back seat, in his car seat, I heard, the, I heard the words, Daddy? Yes, son? Did your team win? Pause. Yeah. Daddy always wins. <laughs> I had to keep it in for a couple of seconds. This is the son that thinks I'm Superman, right? So I finally tell him the truth. I said, no, actually we didn't. We lost. We lost really, really badly, and it was embarrassing. So that's what Judah's been talking about all week now, how bad dad lost. I don't like being weak. I don't know about you. I don't like being physically weak. I don't like being spiritually weak. I want to be able, I want to be right, I want to be strong. I don't like it when I hold other people back, when I lose, or I keep the project at work from going forward. How about you? Um, I don't like being confused. That's uncomfortable. I don't like it when I should know something that I don't know. Like when you tell me directions to get to this one place, this intersection in Austin, and you're naming off street names, and I'm nodding, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I have no idea what you're talking about, where you're at. And, and I'm relying on Google later on to, to help me get me there. But I'm going to act like I know it. I don't like being weak. I don't. Um, <laughs> I don't like looking back on life and on situations and saying, where was my resolve? Why didn't I follow through uh, on that project? Why, didn't I, why wasn't I there for my family when they asked me to be there? And, and, and very often, I like to say to my son, Daddy never loses, right? But the truth is, Daddy does lose. He gets his doors blown off. The truth is, is that Daddy's wrong. And that Daddy messes up. But we're so good at, and I'm so good at, Fleecing everybody, whether it's my family in the car after a game or whether it's on Facebook, putting up an image about myself to the world about who I am or who I, who I project to be. The dangerous part about that is that when I do that, I'm fooling not just other people, but I can begin to fool myself. And spiritually speaking, spiritually, that's a dangerous place to be because if I'm fooling myself that I'm completely independent, that I'm completely good by myself, that I have it all together, I am farther away from God than ever before. And that's what makes this story, especially this account of the Roman centurion in the first century, so amazing, is that this man who has it all together, who is strong, who is confident, 
who has success in his life in many, many different areas in his life, actually has a realization that daddy is weak and that he can't do everything. And that weakness is something that Jesus commends because of where that weakness goes after he realizes his weakness. And it says that God himself, Jesus, marveled that he was amazed at this man's faith. Do you want that faith? Say yes. Okay, then open up your Bibles. This is where God builds up our faith. Luke chapter 7, verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. All right, let's stop right there. First of all, Jesus is finished saying all this. That is talking about Luke chapter 6. Jesus is giving this, this beautiful sermon, very, very popular sermon, very famous sermon, where he talks about God's goodness, he talks about God's love, and he talks about God's word and how God is calling us to put his word into action. After that, that crowd that had gathered with him there, he went to Capernaum, which is the headquarters of his ministry in northern Israel. So he's up here on the map in this, this little rectangle of a land that he does ministry in. And he's up here on the Sea of Galilee. This is on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee, the famous sea where he walked on the water. He calmed the storm. And it's there that you can go today still uh, in Capernaum. You can walk around the ruins and you can see the supposed place where um, uh, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. You can see the synagogue that we're going to learn later on that this centurion perhaps even funded himself. You can see that place. You can see the pillars. That, it's a real place today. You can go there. And here Jesus is in Capernaum, a fishing town, his home base. The people are gathering around. And we learn in verse 2, there is a centurion servant whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. Okay, the word centurion is the same word as century, which means what? A hundred. Okay, so this is a centurion. He's a Roman soldier who is in charge of 100, maybe 50, maybe 100, but no more than 100 Roman soldiers. And so he's an important person. He didn't get here by accident. He was a soldier himself who earned his way up in the ranks, who was in charge of many, many men in the world's most elite army. And so he's important, and he has a lot of influence. He has a servant who falls sick, and the servant in the Greek, you could even say that this is like um, his assistant almost, somebody that's very close to him, that he valued very highly, was sick and about to die. We're going to learn about this man and his characteristics, that he has a compassion for this servant, that he wants to get this servant well, and he didn't have to do that, by the way. He was a Roman, and he had a slave, and slaves didn't have to be fixed. They didn't have to be healed. They didn't, you don't have to pour money into them if you didn't want to. You could let them die. But he has a servant, he has a slave that's like a child to him. That's a family member. He's in his household and he wants to care for him. We're learning about the characteristics of this man and his faith. We're going to learn about what's at the center of that faith later. Verse 3. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnest, earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and he's built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. We learn three more things about this centurion and about his character. Number one, the Jewish people love him. That's a surprise. Why? Because Jews and Gentiles, do they get together? Not at all. No, actually, Jews looked at Gentiles and especially Romans as the occupying army. They're the ones that took their land. Jews often would come to Jesus asking them, him to be their king. Why? So they could maybe overthrow the Romans. But here the Jewish people love this Gentile and they love a soldier. That might tell you something about this guy and about his characteristics. Number two, we learn he loves the Jewish people. In other words, he loves people that aren't like him. The feelings between Romans and Jews was mutual. So... When he looked at a Jew, or the, the Roman people looked at the Jews, they would say unsophisticated, uneducated, lower class. But he, it says here he loves the Jewish nation. Maybe he's even a convert to Judaism. We don't know. But he does have faith. And it says here that he built our synagogue. 
In other words, we learn the third thing about him. He not just is loved by the people, he loves people that aren't like him, and he pours his stewardship, his money, into the thing that he believes in and that he loves. He loves a servant. He loves the people. People love him. And he's financed, or he's found a way to finance an entire building project. <laughs> okay? And the, and the people that go to Jesus say, we love him, he loves us, come and help us. And Jesus goes. He was not far, he, Jesus, was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him. Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I do not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am of a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. A faith that floors God admits weakness in self. This Roman centurion, he could do a lot of things. He could tell men to become a war machine and to march, and hundreds would march. He could tell an entire city to go under his command with his men, and he could siege cities, he could protect cities. He probably was like what our police chief was to the city. He had lots and lots of power to command, but there was one thing that he couldn't command. He could not go to his sick friend and command the disease to stop. He could not bark orders and tell the cancer or whatever it was to cease fire. He was weak. That's incredible. Because very often in our life, when we're a good mother, when we're a good father, when we're a good friend, when we're a good business person, whatever it is that we're good at, very often that same strength that we're good at will blind us to our weakness. And we begin to rely on the things that we're good at and say, well, if I'm good at this in this area in my life, it's going to justify me in my other area in my life. I've heard a dad tell me recently, I'm going to work right now and not spending as much time with my family now. I know I'm not a good daddy right now, but I'm going to be a good daddy because of all the money that I'm going to make and I'm going to spend a bunch of time with them later on. <laughs> you see how we justify our weaknesses and even make them sound godly before God? This man, what's incredible is that he has so much strength, but he has so good a recognition of his weakness. We like independence, and we have holidays about independence. However, you and I, spiritually speaking, are completely dependent upon God. And he has a dependence upon God about what he's heard about Jesus before, and he's going to go to God in his weakness because he is so weak in himself. An example about this is uh, a friend that I have. I met him about two or three years ago. Um, I'll, I'll call him Roy. Uh, Roy was a centurion, is a centurion. He's not really in the military, but he has men and people that are beneath him in his business. And he tells people in south central Texas across the whole state to go and they go and to come and they come. <laughs> you're fired, you're hired, that type of guy. He's not at the top of his business, but he's pretty far up there, and he has a lot of people that he's in charge of, does a lot of public speaking. He also is a man who cares deeply for his family. However, the two conflicted, his business and his family. And one day, Roy came to me, and he finally said to me, and I never would have guessed it, by the way, that life was going, or at least it seemed to go, he said, it's all broken. It's all broken. I said, what do you mean? He said, my family, my children, talking about the decisions his children have made, my marriage, talking about the way his marriage has gone, in shambles, all of it. And you would never guess it. He said, I haven't told a soul. Then I asked him, can you fix it? And you know what he said? I don't think so. And you know what I said? Good. Because you aren't made to fix it. And you can't fix it. Funny thing is, he said, that the more I try to fix it, the worse that it gets. And that, right there, what he said, my friends, is the beginning of a faith that floors God. Because my greatest weakness isn't my weakness. 
My greatest weakness very well could be my delusion of strength. This man doesn't have a delusion of strength. And so he realizes that he himself can't do it. He says, I can't do it. I have to, I have to go to Jesus for this. Look at verse 6 and, and, and verse 7. He says, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. <laughs> I'm broken. You're a holy God. I'm completely inadequate. Verse 7, that is why I do not even consider myself worthy to come to you. He's broken and he's helpless and he knows this sinful condition. We theologians, we call it total depravity. We're born with it. And so when Roy said to me, but I thought that my children were born good. Now what have I done to mess it up? <laughs> no, actually, God's word says, surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. That's how your family works. That's the human condition. That's you, Roy. That's me. We've messed up. Why is my marriage in shambles? Why is my marriage broken? Well, is it just because we're incompatible? No. Actually, it may be because I've been unloving. Or maybe I've been the one that's cheated emotionally, physically, whatever. It's total depravity of self. Why is it that I can't get over my addiction? Why is it that I keep going back to the pet sins again and again and again? Is it because of society? They're putting pressure on me? It could be, but you know what? I'm broken on the inside, and by nature, I was born to love that crap. And I go back to it again and again and again. I'm weak. Why is it that I'm in jail, a physical jail or an emotional jail? It's because maybe I've committed the crime. <laughs> and maybe I'm the one that put myself there. He's in a position of help and of need. And that's just where Jesus wants him. He can't help his servant. He can't drive out the sickness. And so he goes to Jesus. And my friends, if you think that somehow your strength in one area is going to attract Jesus underneath your roof, there's no place for a holy God underneath the roof of a sinner. But Jesus will go to work, and he does go to work, because he goes to work here with this centurion that is unworthy, completely unworthy of having Jesus work in his life. We keep on reading. I'm sorry. Uh, a faith that floors God hears and believes in the hearer's words. A faith that floors God hears and believes in the hearer's words. Look first at that phrase in verse 3. The centurion heard of Jesus. Circle that in your mind. How did, Jesus, how did the centurion come to know that there was, a, that there was a, a healer for him and for his servant? Well, if you go back into Scripture a little ways, you learn that Jesus has been in Capernaum for a while. And this centurion may well have heard of Jesus of Nazareth who has made his home in this city and has been doing marvelous things. Months before this, the same Jesus of Nazareth, this man may well have heard of, was the one who went to that synagogue that he financed and drove a demon out of a man that was sick. He heard of Jesus. In the same city in Capernaum, weeks before, months before, we don't really know when, but at some point, Jesus drove a fever out of Peter, his disciple's mother-in-law. He heard of Jesus, and he heard of the great work that he did. It was in this centurion city, Capernaum, where Jesus was speaking with authority, and he was, he was telling people from God's word the truth. People from all around the countryside came and gathered into one house in that little city, and suddenly the roof caved in. And a man was lowered down on a mat that was paralyzed right in front of Jesus' feet. And whether this centurion was there or not, I don't know. But he may well have heard of Jesus saying, your sins are forgiven. Get up and walk. And the man did. The Bible says that faith is created. And this is how we create faith. This is how God creates faith in us, I should say, by the power of his word. And so when the word was spoken this morning in Olivia's baptism... Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. This centurion has heard God's word, and he has a faith in him that says, I'm going to the healer. It's not just a faith that says, I know the healer, but I'm going to call on the healer, and he calls on him. He sends two delegations to talk to Jesus to get him to come to his servant because he believes in what he hears. I remember talking to Roy um, about the whole situation I thought that I knew the answer because he told me that he was a lifelong Christian, although he hadn't been to church since he was a boy. And I, I asked him, 
Roy, what, what do you think of Jesus? And he said, well, Jesus? They said, yeah, what, what do you think of Jesus? And he said, well, Jesus was the one in the Bible who did a bunch of good stuff, and he died on the cross, and then he rose again, right? He came to life again. I said, yeah, that's him. So what? What about him? He says, I don't know. I just know his story. And for the first time, I believe, in his life, he heard the story that when Jesus lived the perfect life for that father, Roy, who failed so often, and that husband who let his family down, when he, Jesus, went on the cross for Roy and for the sins of the world and said, it is finished, he meant all of Roy's sins. God had brought Roy to a place in his life where he knew his weakness, and he said, I mess it up again and again and again, but he hadn't known in his whole life, or at least if he had forgotten it, that Jesus was the one that finishes. That you hear Jesus' word, and it causes you to believe in him, because on the cross is where he took all of Roy's sins, he took all of your sins, he took all the sins of our children too, and that he restores us, that he redeems us, that he brings us to believe in him because of the great things that he's done. It's called grace. And Roy said two things that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. First of all, he said, how, and by the way, it was tearful, he says, how can I be a father and a husband if I've never even known the gospel? And then he said, how can I lead others if I haven't been following myself? He said that. I asked him, what do you mean by that second one? He said, how can I learn to lead my business? How can I learn to lead my family if I haven't even been following the healer? He didn't say the healer, he meant Jesus. That's faith. It's a breakdown of who we are, but then it's a laser focus on the cross and who Jesus is, and it guides our entire life. It's guiding this life of this hero of faith, and Jesus is absolutely floored by it. It's a faith that you have because it's a faith that recognizes Jesus and his grace and it just is a huge umbrella over your whole life. Look at verse uh, 9. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. God's word works. Right there, the servant gets well, he's healed completely. That's a miracle. Only two times in scriptures has Jesus ever used this type of phrase to say that he was amazed by faith. The other time that he was amazed by faith was when he went early in his ministry to his hometown of Nazareth. And do you remember how he was amazed by the faith of those people? He was amazed by their lack of faith. And they were Jews. But imagine this, the same political party that's going to put Jesus' hands on a cross and, nail, and nails through his hands and his feet, the same, the same government. Jesus says about that man, because of the faith inside of him, because of the brokenness inside of him and the faith that he has in a Savior God, he says there's no greater faith even among of all of God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. And Jesus isn't impressed by this man's armor. And he's not impressed by his money. He's not impressed by his philanthropy. He's not impressed by how many friends he makes. He's not even impressed so much about his tender care for a slave in his household. When it says that Jesus is amazed by his faith, Jesus is amazed by his dependence on God and God alone for his whole life. What is God amazed about in your faith? Is it how much you give at church? Is it your attendance or the stickers that you have in Sunday school, children's church? He's not so much impressed with that. He's impressed when you are on your knees and you say, I'm in greater need of you right now than ever before. And he's impressed and amazed by your faith when you say, I'm sorry for who I am by my nature and I'm relying completely on your cross to restore, redeem, and bring me back to you. Jesus is amazed by this man's dependence, and he's amazed by your dependence on him. So it's okay to be weak. 
It's okay that daddy's wrong, right? In fact, God says that's a gift. And if you don't have that gift, you're going to be farther away from God than ever. And this man who recognizes his weakness is closer to God than all of his peers in Israel. Open up your Bibles. We're going to look at what this means for us. If this word of God, and I believe it is saying this, says depend on God's word, because God's word speaks the truth and God's word is powerful because God's word healed this servant and God's word is at work in your life too, we're going to look into God's word and see how broken we are in just a couple passages and see how God's word heals us. When you're thinking to yourself like this, man, how broken you are and how sinful you are, how, how you have messed things up, and you're looking to God's word for guidance, look at Psalm 103.12. And let's read that one together. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. What about your sin this week? What about your sin this morning? What about the thoughts, the words, the actions? What about all the things that God says in his word that he's calling you to be and to do? You haven't lived up to it. And when you're in that moment of weakness and guilt-stricken as you should be, go to God's word. Just say the word, Jesus, the centurion said. And when you need that comfort, go to God's word in passages like Psalm 103 and say to Jesus, just say the word. And it is. Your your transgressions are removed as far as the east is from the west. That means that there's no end to God's forgiveness. It goes on and on and on. There's nothing you can do or will do that will remove his love from you. Look at the next passage. Another psalm. Psalm 121.7. Let's read this one together. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. Do you have financial anxiety? Do you worry that that you're too weak to take care of your family or that he won't provide? Look at God's word. And like that centurion, you know your great weaknesses. You know you haven't provided as best as you could for your family. But that weakness is going to point you back to the Savior God who also provides for you, who knows every hair on your head, and is not going to let a flower fall or a bird die without looking over it. And that same God says that he's going to keep you from all harm, and he's going to watch over your life. I'm not independent spiritually, emotionally, or physically, but God holds it all together, even my physical. Look at the next passage. This one is from Romans 8.28. I told you earlier, I hate being confused, and I hate being unaware, and I hate not knowing the future. I hate, I, I, I just, I, I, I'm a creature that wants to know everything and wants to know why things happen and how it's all going to play out. But when I come to the roadblock this week, and I can't figure out why the things are happening that they're happening, I'm going to go back to God's word in Romans 8, 28. And I'm going to say, Jesus, you say the word, and it will be. And this is what Jesus says in his word. Let's read it. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And if you're looking for purpose in life, you've been called for his purpose. And he says it right there. When I lose a loved one, and holy word, we've lost many loved ones recently. In fact, we've lost three in the last week and a half or two weeks. And I feel, and I'm grieving in my soul about the loss of my friend or even my, my wife or my children or my whatever it is I can go back to God's word and I say Jesus I'm broken and I have no way to heal I have no way to make better but I'm trusting on you and he says in Revelation chapter 21 I think that's the next one up there put it up there yeah let's read this he will wipe away every tear from your eyes he's talking about heaven there and he's talking about the certainty that he gives us right now that he's going to do that in our sadness Do you see God's word at work? Do you see where God's word is trying to point you back to this grace that takes you by the hand in your weakness and walks you along all the way to the cross so that every time that you have a weakness, you count it as a blessing? Example of this is Paul. The St. Paul, the apostle who wrote much of the New Testament, he had this weakness, and we don't know exactly what it was, but it was this weakness in him that he couldn't fix himself and he knew he couldn't fix and so he called on God again and again and again he says three times that he prayed to God to take away this weakness but what did God do he said no he said no because God was teaching Paul 
and God is teaching you and me in our weakness that he wants us to rely more on him and on his grace, and so he'll keep a weakness in our life. Remember, our greatest danger is not the weakness, it's the delusion of strength. And so when Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, and put it up on the screen, when he writes this, and I'll read it, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. I'm not worthy to have you come underneath my roof, right? I'm not worthy to have you in my house so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Just say the word and it will be so. Grace walks us back to the cross because that's where Jesus wants to reveal himself to you and me. It walks us back to the Word of God. It walks you back to your Bible apps. It walks you back to those scriptures that we just looked at. And it points you to the great strength that you have and will never be taken away from you. Never. How many times did Jesus go into this centurion's house during this story? Zero times. He never stepped foot. Have you ever had Jesus over to your house for dinner? Has he walked through your front door? Maybe the Holy Spirit's teaching us something about where Jesus wants to grow you and where Jesus wants to be in your life, in his word. Because it's in his word that you open it up at your kitchen table with your husband, with your wife, with your family, with your friend, and you drink deep. You drink deep of the grace. You drink it up because you know that you're so lost and you're so, so deprived without it. So my prayer then is this, that we, like Paul, Look at our weaknesses now. This week, when you come to them, look at them, and instead of saying boo-hoo, you say thank you. Thank you, God, for giving me that weakness that points me back to your grace. And let your grace, let Jesus rest on me. Restore me, forgive me, because that's my ultimate source of strength, and that's a faith that will floor God that you have. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God of miracles and of healing, thank you for this story of the Roman centurion and, of, and about the healing power of your word. Help us in our strength not to overjustify ourselves, not to cover up for the things that we are bad at or are weak at or are sinful at just because we're good at other things, but help us like this man in the story, this great hero of faith, to recognize our weakness all the more, to recognize our sinfulness, to admit that we're not worthy to have you come into our house, but to trust in your word, to go back to it, to drink from it deeply. Be with us in our connect groups, be with us in our home devotions, be with us as we bring that life-saving message and we drink from that life-saving message in your word every day of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.